Well, good afternoon. We will provide an update on a couple of things here today. The total here is listed before you. I won't read that out in terms of fatalities as well as also non-fatal. These are gunshot wounds. So this is everyone uh, killed or uh, injured through a gunshot wound. In total, uh, 26 victims, 15 female and 11 male. And you can see the, the racial demographic breakdown. Fatalities from this assault include Lois Oglesby, a black female, 27 years of age, Megan Betts, white female, 22 years of age. She is the suspect's sister. Saeed Saleh, who is a black male, 38 years of age. Derek Fudge, black male, 57 years of age. Logan Turner, white male, 30 years of age. Nicholas Coomer, white male, 27 years of age. Thomas McNichols, black male, 25 years of age. Beatrice Curtis, black female, 36 years of age. Monica Brickhouse, black female, 39 years of age. So you see right now, the, we are able to confirm the arrival of those three individuals in the vehicle that was parked um, behind in the Thai 9 parking lots, you know where that's at, I assume, most of you. And that was 1104 because there was a parking ticket that had that time stamped on it. So we were able to confirm the time of arrival. We know uh, immediately upon arrival, all three headed to a Blind Bob's and remained there until 1213 a.m. when the assailant, in fact, left went across the street to Ned Peppers, where he remained until 12.42 a.m. He then goes back to the parking lot and then spends, this is back to Tainai, where the vehicle's at, and he spends the next eight minutes uh, gathering a content out of the trunk of that vehicle, in which he has also now changed a tire. He has a very heavy backpack that he is carrying. He then goes to the rear uh, behind Newcomb's and uh, the Hart Mercantile um, location, and he is there for about nine minutes. And it's at that point there's physical evidence. Not only is there, there video evidence, there's physical evidence to confirm that he was at that location. and. We'll give you that detail in this presentation. And then at the 1.04 a.m., he emerges behind the alley, and that's when the shooting begins. So this slide here is obviously an overhead view of the Oregon District where this incident occurred, covering all the way from the, if you look in the bottom left corner, of this TV screen, that's the Tai 9 parking lot. So that's where the vehicle is parked. And now we will show you the path that all three, all three took from that vehicle to Blind Bob's. That's this green line that shows their path of travel. All of this will be validated subsequently through video. And I'm going to ask Lieutenant Paul Saunders who is the commander of Strategic Planning Bureau, who had a team of six people working on reviewing 250 gigabytes of video to try to determine path of travel, if we could identify uh, the suspect and then the assailant, his path of travel and time frames. The next blue line is when the assailant leaves Blind Bob's goes across the street to Ned Peppers, where he's there for roughly a half an hour, and then goes east on 5th Street, down Jackson Street, and then west back through the alley where he had originally uh, come the first time, but then turned to go up toward Blind Bob's uh, when he was at that particular walkway. The next is his path of travel once he has obtained the weaponry, the backpack, uh, his vest, this uh, hoodie he put on. So this shows his path of travel from the parking lot uh, back to the walkway uh, right adjacent to Blind Bob's where the f shooting first begins and where three individuals were fatally wounded. Then across the street there's additional victims 
uh, along the north side of Fifth Street, uh, adjacent to and nearby uh, Ned Peppers, and there's another victim on the south side of the street in front of uh, Tumbleweed, correct, Tumbleweed. This now shows, this is the video that was obtained from multiple businesses. I won't try to name them all, but these are the video, um, recorded video that was uh, obtained and documented uh, this time frame, uh, these paths of travel, and the activity most particularly when the assailant left the company of his sister and his companion. So I will now have Lieutenant Paul Saunders come up to the podium and he will walk you through the video, um, some of which we may have to show more than once. I will warn you in advance, some of the video is, is um, rather grainy. Some has really good clarity. So the, the way we're able to say this is that this is the assailant is based on timeline of other video and other data points. So we're, we're absolutely confident, even though the image seems to be indistinguishable of who that is, that we are confident that this is in fact the assailant who is being tracked by video uh, throughout this gap in time from the time he left his sister and his companion and then began shooting. Uh, Lieutenant Saunders, I'll bring you up. The uh, timestamps on the individual videos are, everybody had their own timestamp on their, on their security videos. So the, with the resources we had available, we tried to sync them as, as best we could. So the times at the top of, this, of, the, of the slides are what we're going by. We've highlighted in yellow uh, the different, go back one more map, sorry, the different viewpoints that we have. The lower left right here is a residence that uh, highlights the Thailand parking lot. This is the, re the record store video, highlights the Thailand parking lot. This is to the rear of Newcombs. That's a very clear video. You're gonna see that. That's one of our reference points. And you'll understand what I'm talking about when we see some of the video that's very grainy. To the front is Blind Bob's. Uh, there's uh, on the patio and then there's on the front. We have Ned Pepper's video. We have video to the rear from the Harp Mercantile and then the far right top and bottom are both tumbleweed. Go ahead, go one more for me. So this first video is of the Tainan parking lot. Uh, this is a private residence. The highlighted yellow is where is a tree branch, but it's actually behind that tree branch is, a, is where the vehicle is. And you'll see the three people that's going to be the shooter, his uh, sister and friend. They're walking, so that they're walking east. I'm sorry, eastbound right now. Hold on a second, man. On the right-hand side for each of these slides, there's a thumbnail that shows the video that you're looking at, the camera viewpoint, and it'll show the path. So to keep it in perspective and context. The next slide is going to be behind the Newcombs parking lot, or Newcombs in the alley. This is from their video. The video is very clear. You'll see that in a minute. This shows the three of them together. Please note, the, the individual on the left is the shooter. Uh, he was wearing a shirt for most of the evening that has that very distinctive decal on the back that made it possible for us to identify him in several different video sources. Next. This is gonna be a short clip of a video of Inside Blind Bobs. You're gonna see the shooter enter from the patio. Uh, the sister and friend are still on the patio. He's gonna speak with the doorman for a minute. He's going to exit. The time that uh, we have on this is about 13 minutes after midnight. He leaves here in just a moment. You can go ahead and click next. And now he, at 12.14, so a minute later, this is the shooter entering uh, Ned Peppers. He goes into Ned, Pe Ned Peppers. He's there for about 30 minutes. Uh, Ned Peppers is very crowded, shoulder to shoulder. Uh, and then he leaves. At 12.42, that's a key time also, remember the 12.42 time, because we're getting closer to the point of when the shooting began. So the shooter exits, and we catch him on video going eastbound on 5th Street. You can see we've highlighted it in yellow right up here. Uh, you can see that shirt that helped us find him. He travels eastbound. Uh, you can see the path on the right-hand side in the hoof thumbnail. And then moves on, oh, I'm sorry, back up one, I apologize. Another point to note, so he has just come out of Ned Peppers. This is a video from actually Hole in the Wall, which is right adjacent to Ned Peppers. The front of this is the police cruiser. 
this is where the police are. They're, they're very visible at this point. So the shooter actually comes out of that Peppers and walks right in front of that police cruiser. He's aware of where they were. Or you would think it had to have seen him. Next slide. So this doesn't look like much, but it is his shirt you can see here. This is him in the alley. This is video that was caught from the rear of, uh, this would be Tumbleweed. Uh, we know that's him because of the timing. Uh, you'll see in the next couple slides where it's very clearly him. This is video next door. This is from Hart Mercantile, still in the alley. The shooter is now walking in the alley. You can barely see it's very grainy. He's walking eastbound. He's walking back towards the car at this point. And then this is behind Newcomb's very clear video. When he comes across, he's still walking eastbound. You'll note that he's still wearing a t-shirt. He's still in shorts. There's no backpack. It's 1245 right now. Um, we know that at this point, uh, he's heading back to the car. We catch him in the alley. This is from the record store on Fifth Street. You're going to see him coming from the left to the right. So then we're going to switch over to the private residence uh, camera. That's the one you saw in the very beginning. He's behind the car. If you were on a, a high resolution screen, you can see through this branch that there's movement. Uh, it appears that he's walking around the car. It appears that the trunk lid's coming open and shut. Uh, he's there for about eight minutes. Uh, and you're going to see him when he exits. It's going to take a second here, but the, when the video, we sped it up, so you have to wait eight minutes. But when he walks out, you're going to notice the key thing here is he's no longer wearing a short sleeve t-shirt, uh, and he's now wearing a, a dark hoodie, and he has a backpack. We'll get a better look at the backpack in a minute. I don't know if you can see the movement on here, but there is movement right on the car right there. And here he comes exiting. So he's now he's wearing the backpack. He's wearing a long sleeve shirt. The path on the right hand side shows how he went. He's going to cut back over to the alley. Next slide. This is from the record store, so we can catch him cutting that same path right here. And part of this was just verifying at this point that he had no interaction with anybody else. Here he comes. He's coming out between the dumpsters of the building, and he's going. The thumbnail shows the path that he's going. So this is the video that's right behind uh, Newcomb's. He's going to come from screen right because now he's traveling eastbound. And you'll see that he has the backpack and he's in long sleeves. And the backpack is weighted down. It's not empty. Uh, so this is uh, a key point here because pause for a second, man. Thank you. On the thumbnail, you'll see that uh, this camera view goes to the corner, which is this corner of this building. At this point, we lost him for about nine minutes. We couldn't find him anywhere on the following video. Go to the next screen. So this is a viewpoint from Hart Mercantile, which should pick up. You'll notice right here the opposite corner of that building. And we, and you saw when he walked, we saw the image of him walking across the first time. We never could see him coming this way. Uh, the guys finally picked it up. Watch where we've highlighted the screen here. We'll probably have to play this portion twice. Uh, but when you play it, you're going to see him dart around the corner. And there it is. Pause it and go back and play it one more time. I'll play it one more time for those of you who couldn't see it. But he shoots around that corner pretty quickly. He was behind the building, behind Newcomb's, for about nine minutes. So, click next for me. Next slide. This is uh, the viewpoint behind this. So this is where he, the corner he just went around. We have a pretty good idea of what he was doing there because as he shoots up this alley, uh, that's probably the right, not the right term because eventually he does actually shoot up the alley. But he comes up this alley. We know that he was probably charging his weapon, loading, it, loading the weapon up, because the next day, as we're processing the scene, approximately where that highlighted star is or where this placard is, there is an unspent round. Uh, it's damaged like it uh, had to be ejected because he didn't charge properly. Uh, so that was recovered. It was one of a, a, a two, two, three round matching what the shooter had. So we're pretty sure that as he was turning this corner, he was probably charging his weapon. He had to probably recharge it. and. The next video is going to show the reason why we think that as he was traveling up this alley is when he began shooting. So this is another one that we're going to have to show twice, and I'll tell you when, Matt, in just a second. Because the first thing you're going to notice is uh, the people. That's going to tell you when you actually have rounds coming down range. Then we're going to replay it, and I want you to follow the line that we've superimposed, and that'll show when the shooter comes through here. Uh, it's hard to keep track of both of them, but you're going to notice after you see when they start moving, that the shooter doesn't actually enter the frame until after that happens. 
So this is the patio for Blind Bob's. Go ahead and act that play for me, Matt, please. Now they're moving, they've just heard shots. And if you would play again for me. So he's gonna play it again. And now that you see him when they start moving, the best place to see him is right here. But he'll run this path. So then there he goes. And we know that he's been firing, go ahead and pause for a second. Because just past this umbrella, is the taco stand on this street that's where our first three fatalities occur one of them is sister so we also know from uh homicide tells me that from the eyewitness accounts that as he's crossing fifth street which is right here on the red line he continues to fire down fifth street and there's evidence of that uh that they collected also go to the next slide for me so this slide that you're looking at right now is uh we're going to kind of move you geographically down the street this is from the hole in the wall which is the store that is adjacent to uh, Ned Peppers. The cruiser I showed you earlier is actually it's not on the picture right here, but it's 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 because it's cropped. But the cruiser and the police would be right here. This is a crowd in front of the whole wall there. When the video starts, they are reacting to shots fired, and you're going to see the first uh, response of the officers. Can hit play for me. So they've obviously just uh, heard the gunfire. The first officer coming around this corner you're going to see will be Officer Rolfus, I believe. Followed by, I believe, Officer Denlinger. The remainder of them will come out. They'll fan out right here. And you can see when, um, and this might stutter on me because this video does, but if I didn't this time. So they're engaging right now. Um, so this is the, the officers, because later on you can barely see these guys from the, the shot that we have. And I wanted to start off because that was the first response. So the next slide is now from Ned Peppers. And this is now angling to the west so the shooter is up the street he's crossed fifth fifth street he's been shooting down range or down fifth street the officers are reacting you saw officer rolfus you're going to see him again he's going to come up in this portion of the screen we have had to redact some of this uh just because there's some sensitive uh, uh material on there that we didn't think was good for the public uh, but you're going to get a pretty good idea of the path of the shooter and the first response of the officers. So you're going to see Officer Rolfus kind of come up here, and you'll see on the right-hand side the path of Officer Rolfus approximate. So he's engaging him right now. That was the shooter that just went by. So Officer Rolfus came up, and then he has now just responded back. You want to play that again? Just cut the out a bunch of mics. So Matt, just play it again for me. So, and I put my hand away probably. There's Officer Rolfes that was right in the middle there. There's the shooter coming by. So he was engaged there. So we're going to go to the next slide, which is still going to be from, this is uh, from Ned Peppers. This will be the, uh, the end of this uh, scene. So the first slide of officers I showed you was the officers all fanning out. So they're all up here. So next door is hole in the wall. This is Ned Peppers' front door. You just saw down here. Officer Rolfus engaging uh, the shooter as he was running on the sidewalk. So you're going to see the shooter continue to run right here, and it's going to end right here. Can you play for me? And then pause it for me. So if you look at the thumbnail on the right, uh, you can see that the shooter is right in front of Ned Peppers. The blue dots show you where the police are located on the thumbnail over here. The by our best uh, resources that we have at our, at our fingertips, we believe that the shooting started at approximately 105 and 35 seconds. Um, we believe it ended uh, at 106 and seven seconds. That's 32 seconds. Uh, depending on uh, which video you're looking at, our first engagement was about halfway through that. Um, the, all of this data has been turned over for more technical analysis with the FBI. That'll take quite a bit. Of, I mean, it took us a while to go through what we've got, uh, and we were just honing in on certain parts. They will be going through audio and syncing social media, which we've collected that also. Uh, but in a nutshell, this accounts for the shooter's movements from the time he arrived 
uh, in the uh, Org District to the uh, time of the incident. Kennedy, so the shooting started at 105. What again was the first time you saw him on video at all? Uh, at 23, I'm sorry, 1104 would be the first, uh, 1104, 1105. Uh, that would be in the Oregon District parking lot. Uh, when they're, that's the very first clip I showed you of him exiting the vehicle, that would be our first time on video. Did you say 1242 that he actually passed the police officer? Uh, the time on the, uh, I got time on right here. 20 exits, uh, Ned Peppers. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, there's one on the left side of the vehicle, there's one on the right side of the vehicle. Uh, Ned Peppers, 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 Ned Peppers,
not being able to <clears throat> yeah, it's a great question, too. I would say that the body armor, because of the way it was worn, was, um, was vulnerable. And uh, fortunately, we were able to take advantage of that vulnerability. He had plates, but that's all. Ballistic plates. You know, that's something that the coroner uh, reviews in his examination. He's not complete, and when he's ready to, to discuss, you know, that particular, what the injuries were and, and cause of those injuries, then you can have that information. Do you know the, like, who died at what time, like, the order of the... the, the we, we know, well, we certainly know three individuals who were shot immediately, right around Blind Bob's. So they were the initial victims. <clears throat> what is a little bit... Um, I think uncertain for me, I don't know if our detectives know, I mean, we have someone completely on the, the um, south side of the street in front of Tumbleweed and everyone else is clustered on the other side of the street. So when that shot was fired, that's not really clear for me at this point, although. She was mobile, so she was shot and ran quite a way, so we're, they're still piecing that together. Yeah. In the video where he spoke to one of the people inside the bar, the uh, mm -hmm. workers, do you, have you been able to interview that person and know what they talked about? Yeah, we have interviewed a lot of folks. I can't tell you who all we have spoken to or if, if that person and what the, what the content was. I mean, that's a level of detail we're not going to be able to provide. Sure. Then one of the most important questions right now is the motivation. Looking at this video, looking at other evidence you've had over the past nine days, you can probably have lots of conversations about that. Any more insight about the possible motivation of these killings? Yeah, and I've, I've kind of tried to create a distinction here between motivation and mindset. I think it's an important distinction to make. Um, <clears throat> motivation seems to suggest this specific location, this particular night, these individuals who were victims, I think that's way, way, way downstream. That's not the level of clarity we will have now. We certainly don't have it now. And whether we ever have that is going to be, you know, a question. Mindset, oh, I think we have a lot of information about mindset historical data about mindset and its progression. But I want to remind you that that is the principal focus right now of the investigation by the Federal Bureau of Investigation. So they're running with that. We need them to run with that. Uh, you know, they, that's what they do best, uh, among, amongst other things, by the way. But uh, that is really their role, and we're going to allow them to do that. So is there anything about the mindset at all that you can tell us? I don't think more than I've already amplified it. There's this historical history of obsession with violence and violent ideations, uh, the discussion of interest in mass shootings and the expression of desire to carry out a mass shooting. Um, I think that should be enough thematically that you should get a pretty clear picture of uh, what was going on here. Chief, I want to ask again, that conversation that happened at Blind Bob's with mm -hmm. the doorman, you can't say now what the nature of that I'm not aware of it. I mean, that, that would have been an interview by homicide detectives, and, and I don't have that level of detail. We really wanted to keep this, and I realize you have a lot of questions. We'll try, we're obviously trying to fill in what gaps we can, but I will tell you that this, this was the next big, I think, chunk of the investigation that we felt comfortable of releasing because we, we have high level of confidence. It's accurate in terms of time frame and location and activity, particularly of the principal individual who was responsible for these mass shootings and these murders. Is there any evidence that Connor Betts was a drug user? Yeah, I think there's going to be some evidence of that. Um, the question was, was that play in that night? Uh, don't know yet. And that's part of a toxicology report that typically takes six weeks. Uh, the coroner, uh, last, late last week, said he would hope to get it in two weeks. So that's an important piece, once again, to get some mindset. Uh, won't know that for at least two weeks. Did you find drug paraphernalia in the car? There was uh, some evidence of uh, drug paraphernalia, yes. Chief, you said that uh, neither of the conversations <clears throat> in either of the bars, nothing that would indicate that that's what caused no. him to begin shooting, no. that he was pre-planned it earlier. Yeah. Any idea how much earlier, like one day, one week, one month? <clears throat> you know, hard to say, Mike. I can tell you he was in the Oregon district on Friday night. So what was his mindset then? I don't know. Uh, he was not unfamiliar with this area and the fact he was there the night before you know certainly have to consider uh, there was some thought being given to it at that time
In that nine minute time frame that mm -hmm. he was off camera that you didn't see him, have you had anybody say that they saw him or maybe with someone or No. No. In fact, we look I mean, Paul, your folks looked at I don't think you saw anybody else in the alleyway during that time. No, there? so uh, there's two different segments of period that we really can't see him clearly, and that's one is the when he's at the car with the branch in the way, and then behind, you're talking about behind Newcombs. Yeah. There were people uh, in the alley, in the, in the parking lot, behind uh, Newcombs, Blind Bobs. Uh, there were some people back there. There was nobody that went back to the area where, from either side, we had, we had video from the Newcomb side, and then we had the video from Blind Bob, or from Hart Mercantile, actually. Uh, so nobody went back there. There were no vehicles that came into play during that point. Uh, so he, he appears to be back there alone. What, what did you mean by charged again? <clears throat> so, um, to the chamber, you, you, chamber around. Basically, your, your bullets are in a, in a magazine of some type. Uh, when you charge a gun, you are uh, working the action so that one of the rounds goes up into the chamber of the, uh, of the gun so it can be fired. Gene, how does getting into the cell phone change this investigation for you? What did you learn that you didn't know before? Well, you know, just was just informed. Um, I talked to um, Todd Wickerham Sunday night because uh, this was on my mind a bit and um, had been informed then that he had gotten in the phone. I don't know there's a lot more detail. We, I don't have a high level of detail what was in there, um, but I don't have a sense there's anything that's reveal particularly revealing at this time. Um, they have to have an opportunity to go through that and there's, there's other evidence too they have to go through. So. Uh, nothing that I'm aware of at this time that emerged of significance in its initial examination. He had said it in the to a number of people. He had said to a number of people throughout the past decade or so had made references to some sort of mental illness. Mm -hmm. Are you aware of <coughs> any diagnosis, and if so, of, of what? No, I'm not aware of any diagnosis. Uh, I am aware that uh, he had undergone some treatment. And I can't comment further on that, but I am aware of that. Do you, do you think Matt Peppers was his destination? His it seems so. It seems so. Yeah. Chief, are you thinking that, that he had the weapon in the, in, in the backpack yeah. disassembled in that eight minutes or whatever that span of time was? Correct. Right. I don't think he could have put that weapon in its fully built out state in that backpack and not have it sticking out. So in, to some degree, I think it was disassembled. I think that's a pretty fair uh, conclusion to draw. And of course, you had that drum magazine, too. So um, yeah, I think, he, that's, I think that's part of the explanation for the nine minutes, right? Right. And that's uh, noticing the fact that the, the backpack was appeared to be weighed down. So it's safe to say it was probably in the backpack, and the we've checked with our a lot of our weapons techs and, and the SWAT guys. They all kind of concur that most likely that weapon had to be broken down mm -hmm. to, uh, to some extent. Is there any evidence that? Oh, wait, I'm sorry, hang on, Mike. Is there any evidence that Megan Dutz had a chance to confront Connor <coughs> when she was shot? None. None. Did she even recognize? There was a question even of visibility, quite honestly, from that alley. Because you have the, the patio blind bobs, you have all those umbrellas, you know, kind of hanging down. Uh, you, on, the, her and the, um, the companion are on the opposite side of the taco stand. So there's a real question, could even see who that was on the other side? Mm -hmm. But if he potentially was a drug user and filled out the form for 73 and said he was not in order to get those weapons, could that potentially still be a possibility? Could be could be. Um, part of that is going back historically and trying to determine that, right? Um, and, you know, was it occasional drug use or was it daily drug use? I mean, there, there's a lot of gap to fill in um, to kind of make that call. Chief, when you say drug paraphernalia in a car, you're no, specifically I, referring to what? Yeah. Well, I don't think we go into a little bit of detail, but I don't think it was in possession or is in a car. I thought it was on person. Do we know? I, I would wait. Would yeah, I can't. Remember. There was some found. It was a car of the person, so you know, there's evidence obtained. Um, but not clear where you found it or what it is. So the focus of this. Was I think anybody in the room knows. Time. Somebody knows, but I don't know. Okay. That's not what we're talking about. Yeah. Well, it's just a question yeah. that you guys brought about. <laughs> brought up what? You said that you found it in the car. 
Yeah, there's paraphernalia. There's no question about it. As part of the evidence is being analyzed, you know. So is it fair for us to report you found it in the car or on the person? We'll have to get back. I, I don't have the level of detail. And nobody in the room seems to have it either. So if none of us have it, we probably have to ask. All right, I think that's it. You guys don't have any other questions? You're good? Mayor, can I ask you one oh. question in retrospect of the last week? Yeah. Six days since President Trump was here. Your feeling was it a productive visit to President Trump? Look, I think, I think that uh, the victims in the hospital uh, appreciated the President of the United States coming. I think that the first responders appreciated it. I think it was difficult on the community because he has such a... Um, Everyone has very strong feelings about the president, both positive and negative. And so when we're talking about bringing the community together, he, he's not helpful there.